Good morning. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Good morning and happy Sabbath. So this is a really good lesson again this week. We've been so thankful for this, this set of lessons. Before I start, though, you'll find an interesting background around us. Uh, we have a, a vacation Bible school going on this week. So our background is a little different than our normal church setting. So, wow. But um, I want to get started. And uh, David, would you oh, do our opening prayer, please? Absolutely. Let's pray. Loving Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, and Father God, we are just grateful for this opportunity to come and talk about the lessons that you provided us in your scripture through the Holy Spirit in the life of Lord Jesus Christ and through your prophets. or any experience in this earth is necessary for us to draw close to you. We ask that as we study this week's lesson, that when we, uh, the topic struggling with all energy, that we can understand and have practical application in our life. Be with all the people that are coming to the Sabbath school. Be with the people that will be watching so that everyone can get that blessing from the Holy Spirit. Help our minds to be clear of distractions, and our hearts to draw near you. I thank you, Lord, again for all the blessings. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So um, as we get into this this week, today we're going to talk about um, strenuous, strenuously mm. contending with all energy. So often in the Bible, we compare this life's journey to a race. This race normally isn't just a short sprint, but a marathon. And so <clears throat> just like this marathon we see in Olympic events, we see throughout the Bible our journey in life um, compared likewise. We see it has joys, pains, defeats, twists and turns. So the memory text today is, to this end, I strenuously contend. Not just contend, but strenuously contend. Struggling with all energy, Christ so powerfully works in me. So Christ gives us this energy. And as we do that, we continue to struggle. I want to look at three other verses. Philippians 3.13 says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind, forget the past, and reaching to those things which are before us. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. Know ye not that which run the race run all, but one receives the prize. So run that ye may obtain the prize. So normally in a race, there's only one person who receives that prize. And it says, every man that striveth for mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. But we, an incorruptible, I therefore run, not as uncertainty, so fight I not as one who beats the air. So <clears throat> we're being told here that our race is purposeful, isn't it? And that the crown we're looking for is an un uncorruptible crown. Then in Hebrews 12, 1, it says, Wherefore, seeing, we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. So let us lay aside every weight and sin which so easily beset us, and let us run with, the key word here is patience. Run with patience the race that is set before us. So there's many more scriptures that talk about our, our life as a race. But I want to take a minute and just look at some attributes that <clears throat> I was looking at that have to do with Olympic winners. So first of all, to be a good, uh, a good candidate for the Olympics, you need to be ready to learn. The Olympian standard is working, is, is working hard. In fact, 
going above and beyond, being able to take advice from mentors is how to train smarter is a fine quality. So the Lord tells us to train up our children, doesn't it? That they may be understanding. He also trains us up throughout life. So he shows us much in the Bible as to how to live. So are we good learners? Secondly, do we have clear goals? Every athlete has their eyes on the gold medal. Do we have our eye on the prize? Or are we looking at worldly things? And have a clear path on how to achieve their target. It's about knowing what you want and where you want to go. Do we not have your our goal set upon heaven. Perseverance. Perseverance is, is, is key for a, a, an athlete. There's setbacks, there's disappointments and that go with the territory as an Olympic competitor. In a pressured environment, you need to hold your head high, compose yourself, and be still determined to succeed. Life is full of setbacks. We've learned that this quarter in our lesson. We have an enemy that places stumbling blocks in our path. So perseverance is key. And both in Olympic and in our, our race for heaven. Confidence. They have to, we have to have get up and go. And we have to have confidence to get out there no matter what. So this confidence is not confidence in ourselves, but confidence in Christ. And the, Christ, and the work that Christ can do in us. Many, team spirit. Now this is interesting. You would think, well, do I really need team spirit for heaven? Many athletes will compete individually even though the tasks are completed independently. We should strive to bring home the gold for the team. So every, every soul that is won to the Lord is gold for the team, isn't it? We need to love the competition do we love the Bible? As God's people, we ever keep our mission before us, which is described in Matthew uh, 28, 19, to go and teach all nations. Upholding missions and values. Are we upholding our missions of the church? Integrity is the ticket to the game. So <clears throat> are our lives filled with integrity? Be quick to react. Be adaptable. Sometimes, <clears throat> adaptability is a hard thing to do when you're used to doing things a certain way. <clears throat> so if, if you've practiced a skill uh, uh, 10,000 times and it, when it comes down to the run, there could be an icy spot or some condition preventing you from performing. Are you going to do exactly what you're, you've practiced or are you going to react? And many times, um, as if you're in ministry for the Lord, you have to react and change course so that, um, that winning is possible. So get every brain in the game. Being an athlete is part of a support team. Just like getting every brain in the game, the church is a body, isn't it? So we need <clears throat> to have every person doing their part with the spiritual gifts that God gave us. And then finally... Winning or going for the gold. Second Timothy 4, 7, and 8 says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. So henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not me only, but unto all them who love his appearing. So <clears throat> that is what our goal is, isn't it? Every one of us, who are going, taking this race for eternal life. That is our, our joy and our hope. So we're going to look at this week's lessons. It focuses on several essential elements. First, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, we must cultivate understanding of the truth of God and ourselves <clears throat> in immediate context of our life and in larger context in the great controversy. So we look at not only just how life affects us, but how, does, how is the great controversy affected? While it is true that merely understanding our situation is not enough, this understanding is a crucial foundation, a stepping stone 
which the other elements are placed to construct the right response to the crucible. Secondly, we must understand the nature of our God-given free will. Yes, it is true <clears throat> that God is sovereign and gives salvation and all good things for living and prospering. Thirdly, the collaboration requires us to have a radical commitment and perseverance. Just like these Olympic athletes, that perseverance is important. I want to finish to this day's lessons by talking, uh, uh, giving you a quote from Patriarchs and Prophets. It is by close testing trials that God disciplines his servants. He sees that some powers, which may be used for the advancement of his work, and he puts these persons upon trial. His provident, in his providence, he brings them into a position that tests their character and reveal defects and weaknesses that have been hidden from their knowledge. He gives them opportunity to correct these defects and to fit themselves for his service. He shows them their own weakness and teaches them to lean on him, for he is their only help and safeguard. When God calls them to action, they are ready, and the heavenly angels can unite with them in the work to be accomplished on this earth. So our next lesson for Sunday is the spirit of truth. And David, would you share with us that lesson? Thank you, Barbara, for that wonderful <coughs> introduction. You know, um, these Sabbath school lessons are magnificent. And I really, as I was preparing, I really enjoyed learning. And there are so many verses we can use. But um, the purpose of this quarter's or this week's Sabbath school lesson is what can we do from our standpoint? Because God is working for us now. What can we do? And, um, you know, at times in my life, and I'm sure everybody's life, we pray and say, God, can you make us good? What can you do? And then we go, ab go about with our daily life. Nothing really changes. We feel like people around us do not change. Sometimes it's not fun to see the same thing again and again. So the question is, if God is that powerful, Barbara, why doesn't this happen, right? And Sabbath School Lesson does a great job of talking about why. And one of the disturbing things that we really don't think about sometimes is it is us. We have the power to either restrict or unleash the power of God. And that's why God created us in His image and in His likeness. You see, when sin occurred, sin separated the united family. And because of that, Jesus had to come. And he had to come and he had to tell us what his purpose is. He said, I'm one with Father. And he came so that we can believe that he is one with Father. And that the Holy Spirit would, would direct us towards him and to Father and that we can be united again. So, what's the, what's, what's the parole of the Holy Spirit? John 16, 5 to 15 says, I will read from 8 to 11, and he, when he comes, we're talking about the Holy Spirit, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. You see, sin, definition of sin is lack of faith in Jesus, that he's from God. Concerning righteousness, because I go to Father and you no longer see me. Jesus is the only righteous one who can live with say, uh, uh, God, and we must believe that. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged, we don't need to worry about Satan. We need to focus on unity with God. And when we go to John 16, 13, it says, But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. So when we see what is Holy Spirit telling us, he is telling us who God is. He is telling us who Jesus is. And he is continuously convicting us that 
God is amazing. See, you go to Exodus 34, 5 to 7. It says, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and uh, by no means clearing the guilty. Remember this. God doesn't clear the guilty. God heals the guilty. That's why we go through all these crucibles, trials in life, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and their children. Why? Because God wants to see that our weaknesses have disappeared from our generation from the, to the next generation. See, the prodigal son story is a really amazing story. It talks about this son, prodigal son, who makes two choices. His first choice, he did not want to be with his father. And the second choice, he repents and returns to his father. So what is going on here? Well, Hebrew 11, 6, it says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God, but those who come to him must believe that he is. We need to focus on this sentence. Those who come to him must believe that he is. Here's the thing. We come to God every day. We come to church on Sabbath. Now, coming to God and believing that he is true God is two different things. And we must remember that. And that is where the focus is. There is something called doubtful faith and wrong choice. And we need to have a doubtless faith and, have, uh, and choose the right uh, choice. See, Joshua says, Choose for yourself on this day whom will you serve. As for me and my family... I will serve the Lord. You see, deceit is when choice does not reflect faith or faith does not lead to right choice. Right choice is not always right faith. There are times we make the right choice in life, but we're not sure whether we believe it or not. That happens quite a bit. And that is the purpose of the Holy Spirit. He guides us to show that we our heart, our heart needs to have that cohesion between right choice and right faith in God. Jesus said in Matthew 21, 21, Verily I say unto you, if ye have faith uh, and doubt not, ye shall not only do this, which is done to the fig tree, but you, you will move mountains. So God is, uh, through Holy Spirit, showing us, that we must have doubtless faith to make the right choice. See, Holy Spirit tells us that. Now, how, how in practicality can we do this, listening to the Holy Spirit daily and having that faith and making that right choice? Well, Mrs. Ellen White writes this, which is really three steps that we must do every day. She says that... Um, the evidence of, true, of the truth of God's word is in the word itself. Scripture is the key that unlocks scripture, and it is done through the Holy Spirit. So, you know, holy men inspired by the Holy Spirit gave us the word of God. So, reading the Bible daily is a must to listen to the Holy Spirit and guide us to the right choices. The second one is the strength acquired in prayer to God, united with persevering effort in training the mind of in thoughtless, uh, thoughtfulness and caretaking prepares one for daily duties and keeps the spirit in peace under all circumstances. Earnest, fervent prayer every day. And the third one is that the long fast of Savior strengthened him to endure. He gave evidence to man that he would begin the work of overcoming just where ruin began on the point of appetite where, the, where Eve succumbed to the beauty and the taste of the fruit. You see, fasting, not only from physical, but spiritual fasting from all our sinfulness is the way we have to choose to have a doubtless faith and the right choice. These are the three basic steps. Ellen White says this, Christian unity is a mighty agency. It tells in a powerful manner that those who possess it are children of God. 
it has an irresistible influence upon the world, showing that man in his humanity may be a partaker of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We are to be one with our fellow men, with Christ and in Christ, one with God. Then all of us can be spoken the words, ye are complete in him, in Jesus. Therefore, Holy Spirit will show us we, need, we are not united in God, that we need to be God, united with God, with Jesus. And our goal is to have that doubtless faith, that unfailing faith, and make the right choice to, do the, uh, to, to have that effort to go and be one with um, Christ. And that's the lesson for Sunday. Now let's go on to Monday. Monday's lesson, which is also has to do with Holy Spirit. But here I see a divine human combination. That's the title. And, you know, this title is a very good title because it applies to our life every day. And let's read the uh, verse there, Colossians 1, 28 to 29. We proclaim him admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. You see, the Greek word for labor means to grow weary, to work to the point of exhaustion. So what do we have to do? Okay, how do we get transformed? And that requires human and divine combination. But in this Sabbath school lesson, we're focused on the efforts of humanity through the Holy Spirit, not just by themselves. You see, we, have, we can run the risk of focusing only on our effort, or we can always say, oh, we can't do anything, only God can, and we do nothing. And those are the two risks we run. But as Christians, we know that God created us in his image and in his likeness. And as such, we are to also work with God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit hand in hand because we are a team. So, um, see, the life in the Spirit of Christ is the only standard of excellence and perfection. And our only safe course is to follow his example. And in doing this, he will guide us by his counsel, and afterward, we will receive glory. Richard Foster, who's a Christian theologian, he describes the re reflection of God's grace as a journey along a path. See, we separated ourselves from God, but God's grace gives us the path. Now, in that path, we have places to stop, the, the trials that we go through. In those places, in those trials, we actually are transformed. See, as we travel this path, Foster observes, the blessing of God will come upon us and reconstruct us into his, the image of Jesus. We must remember that the path does not produce the change, but the places, well, it, but it places us where the change actually occurs. And he calls this path a name, the path of disciplined grace. So now that we understand what's going on, we need to have that doubtless faith again to make the right choice. Now, why do we have to struggle to the point of exhaustion? Because Paul says we are natural men, natural man and woman. And what does natural uh, man and woman do? We, 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness to him, nor can we know them because they are spiritually discerned. You see, natural man and woman does not have the Holy Spirit, disconnected from God, and Jesus to them is foolishness. And in Isaiah 53, 6 says that we have all turned away, gone astray, and we turned each other away from God. You see, Ten Commandments is very interesting. Eight out of ten, Ten Commandments, Barbara, says thou shall not. So that means if God says, thou, the, the, thou shalt have no other God before me, in my heart, I would say, I am my own God. That's my natural man tendency. Yeah. If God says, thou shalt not lie, I will say, oh, it's okay to lie. You know? So eight out of 10, God is pointing out 
what our natural tendency is. It's not legalism. It's actually God is telling us to be a better servant. And the two commandments that God says to do that has to do with Sabbath and honor your father and mother and everybody around us is, um, command, is the commandment of service that unites everybody. So do you see the Ten Commandments is all about showing us that our natural tendency is self, go against God, but we must work to the point of exhaustion, always guarding our thoughts so that we can realize that our Jesus was here to unite us with God and we need to stay that path. And every experience we go through, whether it's good or bad, we must grow, get something out of it. We must reflect Christ as we grow, go through it. See, there's three things in life we struggle with mainly to the point of exhaustion. Emotion. Our emotions are uh, nowadays lead us to wrong choices. See, emotion does not give us the doubtless faith and the right choice. Habits, really important. Habits are formed not only by genetics from our family, but it's also formed by how we are raised, our environment, and the people around us. So we are all responsible for each other's habits. So it is so important for us to make sure that our children and everybody around us have that spirit of service, that unity with God through Jesus Christ. And also, we struggle against supernatural power. Uh, the, um, one of the experience was this pastor one time was supposed to preach at a church, and suddenly he receives a call. And then uh, this lady says, oh, you don't like us, we don't like you. I don't want you to preach in our church. Imagine how that person feels. Then the pastor realizes that could be Satan using somebody to try to um, discourage him. This is a supernatural warfare. And so he, in his mind, he was depressed, but in his mind he said, get behind me, Satan just like Jesus commanded, and he felt better. So, you see, if Ellen White says, if Satan sees he's in danger of losing one soul, he will exert himself to the out, utmost to keep that one soul. And when the individual is aroused to his danger and with distress and fervor looks to Jesus for strength, Satan fears he shall lose a captive, and he calls a, a reinforcement of his angels to hedge in that poor soul and form a wall of darkness around him. You see, but if uh, the one in danger perseveres and in helplessness and weakness casts himself unto the merits of the blood of Jesus, then God sends him um, um, reinforcement. You see, the marine, a marine, when you go through the training of being a marine, you wake up at 5 in the morning, you go to bed at 10. There is no time but to learn to serve your country. You become a doctor as an intern. You go to work at uh, 4.35 in the morning. You don't come back for three days if you're in a surgery service. And that you do that because you want to serve people. If you're working in any job, if you put all your effort to the point that every little details you know and about people, then you will be the master of that work. See, um, think about what Christ has done. He has shown us what is good and what does the Lord require, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. It is the unity. See, unity is divinity. Community is divinity. In this world, we are not one, each people. We are in the body of Christ. We are one. Think about um, well, Christ, you know, when he, he does, did not give us any assurance that to attain perfection of his character is an easy thing. It's not. We are not, you know, a noble all-around character is not inherited. It does not come to us by accident. A noble character is earned by not only individual effort through the merits and grace of Jesus Christ, but also through the powers of the mind so that we can form a character. That character is battle-tested. That character is always letting us have that doubtless faith so we can make the right choice. And that is the type of work, that is the type of agonizing labor to the point of exhaustion we have to do so Satan can never slip in our mind. And I believe, as a community, it's not only just my responsibility, but it is everybody's responsibility to hold each other up and go through that struggle daily. Thank you, Barbara.
Thank you. All right. When we look at Tuesday's lesson, the disciplined will. This one was for me, you guys, frankly, because <clears throat> do I have a dis do I have a disciplined will? Uh -huh. And I liked the example in the lesson because they were talking about food, and it's like, what do I feel like eating? I, mean, I don't know how many conversations I've had with friends and family. What do you feel like tonight? What sounds good? And I think about <clears throat> I think about that. So what do I feel like? I might feel like a hot fudge sundae. Is that what I should be eating if, I've, if I have blood sugar issues? <laughs> Maybe not. Should I be eating a salad? But what will I succumb to? Yeah. What choices will I make? And so we want to take a look at a few people in Scripture. Um, but first of all, Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Hmm. Who can know it? And I think, I think that's true even of ourselves. I know we look at, at others and we can see that. Yeah, well, so. that's, that's not my truth. That's, that's your truth, you know? And so <clears throat> can we honestly look within and say, yes, my heart is truly deceitful on whatever issue it might be. And we are desperately wicked. <clears throat> we can create a false picture of reality, causing us to make bad choices and setting us up for crucibles, even of our own making through this. So let's look at a few people <clears throat> who struggled with this. And I want to end with um, someone who actually did a pretty good job of it, of, of, of this. So our, our first is in Genesis 3, 6. And the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took the fruit thereof and did eat, and also gave it to her husband. Now, what was the issue here with this food? The problem was God had told her, don't eat it. Choice. So she had this choice, but she looked at it, and she goes, it's pleasant. Mm. The, word God, the word God gave her against it, she ignored because the serpent said, oh, it's fine. Go ahead and eat it. So she ate it, and then she talked her husband into eating it. And he actually thought about it longer than she did before he ate it. And so they both succumbed to appetite. But hers was more, this, is, this, is, um, this, this food looks like it's really, really tasty, at, and she ignored God's, God's direction. But her husband, not only did he think the food was tasty, but he didn't, wanna, he didn't want to not sin and have his wife sin. So his choice was even more difficult mm -hmm. than her choice. But did they fall? Yeah, we're, we're examples of that today. So we see that, <clears throat> that appetite and, and, and these choices about feeling um, caused our early fathers to sin. Let's take another look at, at 2 Samuel 11, 2 to 4. And it came to pass at an eventide that David arose from his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. And the, view, the, the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired of the, after the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba the daughter of Elam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David <clears throat> sent messengers, messengers and took her, and she came into him and lay with her, and she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned to the house. So <clears throat> when we look at this, I don't want to get into too much as to who is at fault, because I think we could... We could spend a lot of time laying blame here. But the, the bottom line is that appetite and passion mm -hmm. were a part of this. So when we see something that we know we shouldn't partake of, like our neighbor's wife or husband, if we, if we use this example of King David, are we able to withstand that temptation? Now, this temptation for David became even greater because he ended up, putting her husband to death. 
And so, and, and we see also that David's sin sent him into a horrible crucible. Because <clears throat> when he did marry her, they lost their first son. Their first son died. Mm -hmm. And so David realized his sin. But he didn't realize his son, sin until it was too late. And so oftentimes, again, we like see that. ourselves, we're, we're in it, we've struggled, and we failed. The good news here, though, is in the end, God said David was a man after his own heart, which meant David <clears throat> did return to God and turned away from his, from, um, his sin. Um, let's look at Galatians 2, 11 and 12. But when Peter came to Antioch, I withstood him to, fa to, the, to face because he was to be blamed. For before the cert that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they, they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing which of them were of circumcision. Now this was... <clears throat> in, in their day, circumcision was, was an issue. Mm. And it took the, the church, early church, quite a while to get past this issue of circumcision and uncleanliness. And so there were, uh, when, when Christ came and said there's neither Jew nor Gentile, he took this issue of circumcision away. But it took the early church members quite a while to get past that. And while we don't see that as an issue now today, it was in their time. And so what we have to look at is our own prejudices, our own experience, our own misconceptions. Do they get in the way of our ability to share God with others? Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> we really need to, <clears throat> to make sure that those kinds of, of feelings are not getting in the way. And these feelings can be, feelings of prejudice and misconceptions can be very, very strong. And so we have to be open enough with ourselves to, to take an honest look at, am I just being prejudiced? Is this a misconception? What is it that I'm missing? And go back to what we learned as, the Olympic, and the, uh, as an Olympic athlete, be a learner and learn to understand where we may be wrong with our misconceptions. But there's someone who did this well, and he's one of my very, very favorite Bible characters because, and it, that's Daniel. And you never see Daniel being chastised by God for his behavior mm -hmm. or his... His, um, his lifestyle. So let's read, I want to read Daniel um, 1, 3 through 9 and 17. We'll do that this kind of quickly and then I want to point out a, a couple of key points here. And the king spake to Azaphus, master of the eunuchs, that he should bring certain children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom there was no blemish, well favored, skillful, full of wisdom, cunning and knowledge, understanding of science and such as had he might teach and learning in the tongue of the Chaldeans. So he wanted them, they wanted them to learn the Chaldean ways. And the king appointed them a daily portion of the, of the king's meat and wine, and he drank, so nourishing them three years. And at the end thereof, that they might stand before the king. And, that, and among these were the children of Judah and Daniel, Miha, Michelle, and Azariah unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave them the names Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But Daniel supposed in his heart he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, mm -hmm. nor <clears throat> the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. So God gave Daniel favor with the prince of the eunuchs. And the children in 17, they were given knowledge and skill and learning and wisdom mm -hmm. and understanding in all visions and dreams by Daniel. So we see some things here. Daniel was put in a position that most of us will never have to experience in our lifetime. Yep. He was taken captive. He was ripped from his family. He was taken to a strange land. He was asked to eat <clears throat> um, things that probably 
were either offered to idols, were unclean, or unhealthy, that God had told them they would never do, that, that, they, should never, that they should never eat. He understood all these principles. And yet, he did one thing. And this is one thing that we all, I feel, need to do. He purposed in his heart. He made a decision beforehand that feelings wouldn't get into it. Now, he was probably castrated because he was with the eunuchs. He was, he was, he was a captive. And talk about a crucible. Hmm. But even in his crucible, he would not let go. And so <clears throat> this is something that uh, he is, a, he is a, a true Bible character that we can look at and uh, hope to emulate. So um, with that, I think we need to move on to our next day, which is a radical commitment. Wow, what a name. <laughs> huh? What a name, radical commitment. <laughs> I really believe here that, <laughs> that uh, Daniel, what Daniel did was a radical commitment. Yep. A radical, radical action is necessary, not because God made the Christian life difficult, but because we in our culture have drifted away from God's plan for us. People, people often wake up and wonder to themselves, how did I get so far away from God? It was funny, I was talking with a young adult <clears throat> here recently who was, was with the church, and he's, he's um, got jobs now out in the world and, and with, with a group of people that have a pretty um, secular lifestyle. And I asked, I asked, I said, how are you handling this? Mm. And he said, sometimes I, I look around me and go, how did I get here? <laughs> and so I think we've all been in those positions where we've looked around and said, how did I get myself in this situation? And sometimes it's out of hurt. Sometimes it's out of anger. Sometimes it's just out of sheer rebellion that we get ourselves in these, in these situations. Matthew 5, 29 and 30 says, <clears throat> if your eye offend you, pluck it out and cast it far from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not thy whole body wow. shall be cast into hell. And thy right hand shall offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not the whole body should be cast into hell. Now Jesus here is speaking of a, a sexual sin. However, the underlying principles of deal with, with all sin. Principles can apply to um, any general uh, sin that we have in, in, in our lives. So, but one of the, the, the interesting part of the scripture is he is not asking us to harm our bodies. Now, I've worked in, I, I've used to, to be around psychiatric units. Mm. And I have seen people who've actually believed this and tried to physically harm their bodies because of their, their misunderstanding and because of their, their, their mental uh, and uh, social issues. And then, you know, the um, pagans, prophets of Baal, they were you know, hurting themselves when Elijah was praying. Yeah, they yeah, would. It's a, it's a practice. They would cut themselves. Yeah. 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 So the, the, the plan is not for us to harm ourselves, but he's calling us to control our minds mm -hmm. and our bodies, no matter what the cost. The text does not say we should pray and that God will instantly remove sinful tendencies from our lives. Sometimes God may graciously do this for us, but often he calls us to a radical commitment to give up something just or to start do, or doing something that we may not feel like doing at all. What a crucible that can, that can be. The more often we make the right choices, the stronger he will become and the weaker the power of temptation in our lives. And I want to go back to Daniel for just a minute because Daniel did that. <clears throat> you see throughout the book of Daniel that he started with the first test of appetite mm -hmm. of the food and he passed that test so god gave him even more gifts that's kind of interesting when 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 we when god sees that we're serious and he asks us to do something and we do it then he equips us 
to move forward to do that. And so we, we see that with Daniel. Then we see them, the plain of Dura, where they had to bow down and worship. It became about worship then. And then Daniel in the lion's den, also another story of worship. But as the tests got more and more difficult, they were able to pass these tests because they had already filled the, that commitment in their lives, that radical commitment that they would not sin against God. <clears throat> so we see that our life is, uh, is warfare. The Apostle Paul speaks of wrestling against principalities and powers as he fought the good fight. Ephesians 6.12 says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Those spiritual, that spiritual wickedness is not just in the lives of others. It's in, it's in our, our lives as well. Again, he declares, We have not resisted into blood striving against sin. Today, sin is cherished and excused. The sharp sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, does not cut to the soul. He has, has religion changed? In Hebrew 4.12, we say, For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, mm -hmm. piercing and even dividing asunder the soul and spirit and the joints and marrow and the discerner of thoughts and the intents of the heart. So we, we, we see in Hebrews that if we allow the word of God, the spirit, to cut us to the, to the bone, to, to, to ferret out that sin, along with fighting the spiritual warfare that Ephesians 6 talks about and putting on the armor of God, we too can, can ha make radical commitments. <clears throat> so... We know, too, that the enmity between God and Satan hasn't slowed over the years. In fact, if anything, it's heated up. A religious life once presented difficulties demanded self-denial. All is made very easy now. Why? Why are our lives, why do we think lives are, are, are when our lives are easy, why are they easy? The, and it's because the professed people of God have compromised the power of darkness. So we need a revival of straight testimony. Mm -hmm. And we see that in, in the testimony to the churches. We need to put away all sin, every dull, darling indulgence. Our religious life must be cut. The, the right eye, that hand, must be sacrificed. Uh, it will cause to offend. Are we willing to renounce our wisdom to receive the heavenly kingdom as a child? I want to go back a second to this issue of straight testimony. Why do we think straight testimony is important? Because straight testimony is what makes us decide whether we're going to follow God, we're going to follow Satan, we're going to follow self. And this straight testimony, Ellen White says in CET 176, I asked for the meaning of the shaking I had seen and was shown that it would be caused by straight testimony called forth from the council of true witnesses to the Laodiceans. So we as Laodiceans today need that straight testimony to make sure that our lives are right with God. This will have its effects upon the heart of the receiver and will lead him to exalt the standard and pour forth the straight truth. Some will not bear the straight testimony. They will rise up against it. And this will cause what causes the cha shaking in the, in the church. So we want to see, we want to make that radical commitment. So um, some thinks it's synonymous with the absence of troubling and, and, and suffering, but it's not. It's really how we manage the crucibles in our life. David, yes. you've got the very last lesson for t this week. Thursday, the need to preserve, persevere. The need preserve. to persevere, yes. Persevere. Preserve too. Preserve because and persevere. Without, without perseverance, there is no preservation of life. That's right. You know, and that is, thank you, Barbara, that is brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And uh, what you said is um, that Daniel passed the test of appetite. 
-hmm. We never think of it that way. In America, we have abundance of food. And I remember <laughs> when I first came to the U.S., I found drive through And I was <laughs> like, what is this? This is magical. You don't have to get out of the car. Yeah. Amazing. So, you know, um, let's, let's talk about this need for per per perseverance. And this the greatest story, one of the greatest stories is, um, you know, Jesus is the ultimate story of perseverance. But we have the story of Jacob. And Genesis 32 is a very interesting story. Um, we have to go back to God's character, his merciful, long-suffering, mm -hmm. but he does not let the guilty go. Now, we know Jacob was guilty of deceiving and lying and other things, but God did not let him go. He had to endure a lot of things. Finally, he's here, back with his brother. He's going to be going to see his brother. So he, God told him, go back. You can, you know, see your brother. Everything will be okay. Um, Jacob had initially probably doubtless fate, but then here he comes. He sees the angels of the God, the angels of God, and he gets all excited, happy. You know, he sends Esau the message that he's coming. He gives him some gifts, but guess what? Esau is still angry. He's bringing in 400 men, which is the army, and Jacob's whole spirit is just gone. You know, suddenly he finds himself saddened. He's doubting. Okay, now. You know, he uh, sends everybody away. And here he is, all by himself. And there he sees a man. And he talks to this man, and he fights with them, wrestles with them. You know, and um, he gives all his strength, all his struggle. And Jesus ultimately says, you know, let me give him a battle scar a testimony of his faith. He touches his hip, and the hip joint dislocates. Do you know when people have hip fracture, Barbara? You know the pain is so excruciating. Yeah. Here we see that the hip joint is dislocated with the blood vessels and the nerves still attached to it. Can you imagine? But there he is, holding on to Christ, realizing this is Christ, and he doesn't let go. And then Christ says, let me go. And he says, not till you bless me. So in the end, in the end, he gets the blessing. You see, the blessing was promised many years ago. But now, through perseverance, through training and all these things that he went through with his uncle's house, he has come along and finally he holds on to God and gets the blessing. God here does a lot of interesting things with Jacob. You see, Esau, Mrs. Ellen White writes that as God was wrestling with Jacob, Esau had a vision. And he saw that he was holding on to Jacob. That Jacob was sad that he lost his mother. He portrayed God. Jesus portrayed a picture of a humble, humble Jacob. Initially, Jacob was very happy. He was confident. But through Esau, and he was coming to see him, his confidence was gone. Think about how amazing our God is. He comes down and t fights with Jacob, not to destroy his confidence, but to actually make him stronger through humility. What does uh, Paul say? My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So God comes and cheers him up, and he has a limp, but now he also as the blessing. So what happens? Esau comes and he sees Jacob and he sees that he is crippled, that he has compassion on him. Now here, all of Esau's men, you know, initially they were all ready to attack Joseph, but uh, Jacob, but here he, they see the peace, the brotherly love. That, that testimony of unity is displayed through humility, through act of God, but most importantly, the perseverance of Jacob unto Jesus. And that is the real message for this need for perseverance. You see, the Lord, Mrs. Ellen White writes, the Lord frequently places us in difficult positions to stimulate us to greater exertion. See, we, how much of the brain science say that we use? Maybe 15% at a time. But I don't know if that's true. 
However, we know we are capable of doing so much more because we are created in the image and likeness of God. So we are capable of doing greater exertion. In His providence, special annoyances sometimes occur to test our patience and faith. God gives us lessons to tr of trust. He would teach us where to look for help and strength in time of need. Thus we obtain practical knowledge of His divine will, which we so much need in our life experiences. Faith grows strong in earnest conflict with doubt and fear. And that is necessary because when the victory comes, then it is much more joyful and enjoyable because we persevered. We worked our hardest, right? Um, now, um, there's another thing happened here. Jacob having all these things could have stirred jealousy in Esau's mind. But God, in this amazing act of what he did, every, Jacob appeared humble to Esau also. And this humility is important for Christian life. Christian life, I notice that as a humble person, it's easier for me to talk about Christ to others I wouldn't pull up with a Rolex and a Ferrari and try to feed the homeless. It would not look good. Therefore, it is also how we present ourselves to this world. Even if God gives us a lot, we must be able to willing to give up anything in the moment's notice. You see what Job says, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him, but I will maintain my own ways before him. So therefore, it is really important today for all of us to remember this, that perseverance as the obedient servant like Jesus is the key to unity with God. Remember, we're talking about unity because we decided to separate. Satan separated God's kingdom with one-third of his angel. It's all about unity, restoration of that. Perseverance is the basis of sincere faith sincere religion as it perfects the flesh and connects us with God in spirit and in truth. Without hard times, true transformation of natural man being uh, um, a true transformation of natural, our natural self into spiritual self is not possible. And we may appear light on the scale like Belshazzar did. So let us, uh, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it to a robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, coming to the likeness of man and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself. You see in Zechariah, Jesus, people will ask Jesus, where did you get this wound? What happened? And Jesus will tell them what happened. Barbara, you and I, we walk in heaven and there will be wounds. And people will ask us what happened. And there will be film. There will be angels rejoicing. And Jesus will tell us, come and sit with us, eat with us. Wouldn't that what we dream about every day? Isn't that, though, isn't that worth persevering for? Because our natural self is to divide, destroy, not only us, but others. But here, perseverance for unity is the key. To Christian community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those, those wonderful thoughts. Uh, in conclusion today, I just want us to think a minute about finishing this race, that gold. Remember our first lesson was we talked about gold tried in the fire. Mm -hmm. And we're looking for that golden crown and that, that literally that gold medal of heaven, aren't we? Wow. And so I want to give us some, you some thoughts here. To be refined, we need, these are the things that we need. To be refined by the discipline of active will. Hmm. And active will means consistent will. Consistently active will. Be refined through the discipline and the struggle. Struggle in overcoming our emotions. Struggle in overcoming deeply ingrained habits. Struggle in overcoming supernatural powers. Revine through discipline of perseverance 
refined through the discipline of communion. All of these, these refinements and struggles through these crucibles are what brings us to the gold. Mm. I want to just finish with Colossians 3, 1 through 4. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then ye shall also appear with him in glory. Thank you. Let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we're thankful for this wonderful lesson. Yes. Lord, we are excited to finish this race, to be in heaven with you. And so, Lord, we pray each day that you will give us the strength, that we wash our robes white in your blood, that we are able to deal with the fiery darts of the enemy through our faith, Lord. We know that time is short on this earth, and we look forward to that time with you. But between now and then, Lord, there are many crucibles yet to go through. So we pray, Lord, that we don't crawl out of the crucible before we're refined, but we let that crucible refine us into becoming perfected in Amen. you. Thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, and thank you.